That's the way that it goes, right? <clears throat> well, it's good to have you here this morning, and uh, or if you're tuning in online after the fact, uh, thanks for being here. Thanks for being such a, a great body of believers. Um, it's not something I take for granted. I had a pastor's meeting this week, uh, pastor's lunch, I guess you could say. It wasn't really a meeting because we went to the ranch, pizza ranch. And uh, we had a really good turnout, really good discussion. But you guys, and Jody has shared this before, not everyone has a great experience as a pastor. Tom probably remembers that as a pastor's kid. And um, thanks for being you. And thanks for, um, you know, I preached a few months ago, a couple months ago, and I referenced it again this Sunday, or this Tuesday, whenever I had the pastor's luncheon. I think it's Colossians chapter 3, verse 13, that talks about make an allowance for other people's faults. Make an allowance. Have money set aside in the bank account for when people let you down. And it starts with those closest to you. Hello? Make an allowance for your spouse. Right? Jody, Jody has a big allowance. She's got to. It's got, she's got to have a lot of allowance. But, but you know, we're not perfect people. Um, we make mistakes. As pastors, I'm talking about. We don't see everything clearly any better than you do. And we do dumb things sometimes. Thanks for making an allowance for our faults, our failures. Because some people, and they're cuckoo for cocoa buffs, actually believe that pastors should be perfect. I know, it's crazy. So thanks for not being those people. Amen. If you have a Bible this morning, turn with me to the book of Matthew. Matthew chapter 1 is where we're going to be this morning. And this is my last sermon of 2022. Well, I give some pastor remarks on Christmas Eve, I guess. Um, but this is my last Sunday sermon for sure of 2022. And uh, you guys, I'm ready for a break for the next few weeks. I'm looking forward to it. I have a question to pose to you this morning. And that is, how flexible are you? And I don't mean physically, although we could have a conversation about that. How flexible are you? Um, what I want to talk about today for a couple minutes is this reality. God's plan isn't always, and usually isn't, like our plan, but it's always the best plan. Let me say that again. God's plan isn't like our plan, but it's always the best plan. We're going to find that out today from none other than Jesus' earthly father. You guys, I was studying Joseph this weekend, and my mind was blown away of all the things that could be said about this man um, that apply to our lives. So let's look at it together. Matthew chapter 1, verse 18. It says this in verse 18, this is how Jesus the Messiah was born. His mother Mary was engaged to be married to Joseph. But before the marriage took place, while she was still a virgin, she became pregnant through the Holy Spirit. Um, talk about that today at lunch with your middle schoolers. You'll have a lot of fun. Right? We're going to do some Q&A about how a 14, probably 14-year-old 14 girl gets pregnant outside of having sexual relationships. And by the Holy Spirit, by the way. Have fun. <laughs> I was a middle school, uh, uh, middle, I, part of my responsibility as a youth pastor was way back in the day when we still had Sunday school. I had to have a middle, a middle school. We called it junior high school. You had junior high and you had senior high. And I was a little bit devious, kind of like Gene, probably a little bit. And uh, I'd come into that classroom some, some Sunday mornings. I'm like, let's have some fun and talk about a virgin getting pregnant from the Holy Spirit. <laughs> We're really going to blow their minds, you know. And they would just be like, ah, like, oh my gosh, what happened? She became pregnant through the power of the Holy Spirit. Verse 19, Joseph, her fiancé, 
was a good man and did not want to disgrace her publicly, so he decided to break the engagement quietly. As he considered this, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream. Joseph, son of David, the angel said, do not be afraid to take Mary as your wife. For the child within her was conceived by the Holy Spirit, and she will have a son, and you are to name him Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. All of this occurred to fulfill the Lord's message through his prophet. Look, the virgin will conceive a child, she will give birth to a son, and they will call him Emmanuel, which means God with us. When Joseph woke up, he did as the angel of the Lord commanded and took Mary as his wife, but he did not have sexual relations with her until her son was born, and Joseph named him Jesus. Is there any better text of Scripture in the whole Bible that shows us that sometimes God's plan isn't like our plan? And yet, we still are surprised by it. We're still frustrated by it. Like, I don't know about you, but um, if you're like me, your prayers are kind of more suggestions. Right? If we were honest today, most of us pray, not prayers, we pray suggestions. We tell God how it should be. Reminds me of a story, there are two young boys who are spending the night at their grandparents'. At bedtime, the two boys knelt beside their bed to say their prayers. When the youngest one began praying at the top of his lungs, I pray for a new bicycle. I pray for a new Xbox. I pray for a new DVD player. His older brother leaned over and nudged the younger brother and said, Why are you shouting your prayers? God isn't deaf. To which the little boy replied, No, but grandma is. Sometimes, if we're honest, our prayer life is really suggestions to God of how he should do things according to our plan. Right? You know, as a pastor, there's a couple things that scare the heck out of me. Number one is a prayer chain. Number two is a prayer meeting. What? You're a pastor and you're saying that? Yes, I am. Because sometimes we use prayer for the wrong reasons. We use prayers as a means to telling God what he's doing wrong or how it should be. And if you look at Joseph in our text this morning, Joseph was suddenly faced with an uncertain future. Look, you don't come to be, get, be, get engaged to a, a young woman overnight. Now, some guys do because they're desperate. I get that. They'll take any living, moving, breathing female. But chances are there was a lot of thought that went into this whole process that Joseph found himself in. The Bible says in different versions that he was a righteous man. He was a just man. He honored the law of God, right? And so he was taking the appropriate steps of engagement to marriage to Mary. He who had hit, crossed his T's and dotted his I's. He had everything lined up, probably even had a really nice ring if they did it back then. And yet, God intervened in his situation and caused his future to look much different than the one he had imagined. Think about that for a minute. And if you look throughout Scripture, we see an ongoing clash that happens all throughout Scripture where man's will and God's will are at odds with each other. In some ways, we could argue that for humans, for us, for people, it is the ultimate struggle that we're in. Now listen, I know we like to, you know, talk about the devil. The devil, he's out to get us. He comes to steal, kill, and destroy. It's true. But sometimes we are our own worst enemies. Sometimes we play, blame the devil, and the devil's like, I didn't have anything to do with that. What are you blaming me for? You know, we, we, get our, we get ourselves in trouble because of our own decisions, because of our own choices, because of our own values. And then we're surprised when the world is collapsing 
around us. Even Jesus had this struggle. Did you know that? In Luke chapter 22, verse 42, we read that powerful account of Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane who said, Lord, remove this cup from me. In other words, he was honest. He said he didn't want to do it. But he also had resolved himself and came to the point where he said, yet, not my will, but your will be done. Here's the thing. If we're going to go on with God, that's like an old school type saying that maybe some of you remember who are, who've been on the planet longer than I am. If we're going to go on with God, then we're going to have to merge off of our lane and get on his. God's saying, take it's time to take an exit. It's time to take an exit. So how do we do that? How do we position ourselves in such a way that when we look at our lives and we look at our plans and our desires and what we want and how everything should go this way and that and then it doesn't, how do we shift? How do we put ourselves in a position where oh, we acknowledge, okay, God, I was going this way. I had this plan. I was going to do this. And now it seems like you're sending me in a different direction. Well, if you're taking notes, let's look at this text again because... Our text leaves clues. Number one, let's look at Joseph. He was righteous. Joseph was righteous. Look at what it says in Matthew chapter 1, verse 19. Joseph was a good man, and he didn't want to disgrace her publicly. There was something about Joseph that he prioritized in his life being a man of God. You know, I, I was talking with one of my boys this last week, and I said, you know, you should have some things written down about what you believe, God, who, who you believe, not what, because we all get on the what. What am I supposed to do? What am I supposed to do? What am I supposed to do? You should have a list of who am I becoming, right? Right? Who is it that I believe God is creating me to be? Not what am I going to do, not who am I going to do it with, but what am I becoming? You know, we lost, we've lost this sense, and, and, it, and it breaks my heart because it became so um, commonplace that it almost became redundant and it almost became a meme. But there was this movement back, and you remember, uh, several years ago where people read books and they wore bracelets that asked the question, what would Jesus do? Right? And so a lot of times what we talk about is particulars. Right? We talk about, is this a sin? Is this not a sin? Da, 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 da. Well, one of the quickest ways to answer that question is to say, what would Jesus do in this situation? And actually, it's not really quick because it's complicated <laughs> sometimes. Right? My kids come to me and they want to, you know, ask deep theological, profound questions because they think I have the answer, which I don't. But one of the things I can say is ask a question back. What would Jesus do in a situation like this? There could be a long pause. We don't know. Or maybe we have an idea of what he would do, but we're not really sure how to flesh that out. You know, before Joseph ever got into this situation, he had become a man of God. You know, this is word to the wise for the single people. Sometimes you focus too much on finding the right person instead of being the right person. Right? Oh, I got to find the right person. I got to find the person that, that, you know, God has for me or whatever. That's great. But are you becoming the right person for someone else? Somewhere in Joseph's life... The Bible says there was something about this man that indicated that he was righteous. Some versions say just. Some versions talk about he honored the law. Either, no matter how you put it, if your priority is to be a man or a woman of God, when the pivots come, and they will, you'll be able to sustain it a little bit better and realize, okay, this, is, this was my plan but obviously it's not what God had for me. 
so I can shift. Secondly, Joseph was merciful. It says that he did not want to disgrace her publicly, so he had decided to break the engagement quietly. Now, the law said that she could actually probably be stoned. Did you know that? And he could have made a public spectacle of her, and he would have been right, and he would have been justified. But there was something inside of him that he had developed a merciful spirit. Do you remember what one of the things that Jesus said? He told those followers, the listeners that were around him, he said, go and learn what this means. I desire mercy. Mercy. Mercy is not treating someone how they deserve to be treated. I mean, he took great steps. There was, he was righteous. He was just. He honored the Lord by obeying his word. But there was something inside of him that was merciful. Where does that come from? That ability to be merciful. It comes from knowing God has been merciful to us. It comes when we realize that we deserve the cross. We deserve the punishment. And yet, Christ took our place. And there is nothing, think about this, there is nothing that anyone can do to you in your life that is worse than what we did to Jesus here on this earth. Not one thing. So there, you'll never come across a situation, you'll never come across someone who treats you so poorly, who treats you so badly, that it would supersede the way that Jesus was treated treated. Why? Because Jesus was sinless. He actually didn't sin and he was punished. Right? He actually was innocent. We're not innocent. <laughs> We're never innocent. Right? I mean, sometimes we are in a situation, but my point is, is that we don't have a sinless life. We carry with us this body of sin. Amen? Amen. And so Joseph had developed something in his life that caused him to look at this situation and say, I'm going to be merciful to this young woman. Even though his initial plan, again, was what? To, to not go forward with the marriage. He did so in such a way, the Bible says, that he was going to break the engagement quietly. Think about in your own life, someone who has treated you poorly recently. Ask yourself this question. When you look at that situation, you look at that person. Do you have a merciful heart towards them or a vindictive heart? Because one of the things that we preach, one of the reasons we preach and one of the reasons we teach scripture is to remind all of us what happened, right? The Hebrews, the book of Hebrews said these things were written before us to instruct us. These things were written before us to instruct us of how we should live. Joseph didn't treat Mary as he could have. Wow. When I was reading that yesterday, my mind was blown. Uh, I watched one of the um, trials recently from one of the school shootings where the victims of the family were able to address the accused before they were sentenced. And it was heartbreaking to watch, as you can imagine. But it's very eye-opening and beneficial. And this particular father, I don't remember what school shooting it was, addressed the accused and said, I will 
never forgive you. Burn in hell. Do they, are they justified in saying that? Sure. A hundred percent. The problem is, we're guilty as well. Would we want to hear those words? Because if it wasn't for Jesus, we would. Amen? God would say, I will never forgive you. Burn in hell. But because of Jesus, we have been given a second chance. Next, the thing that I noticed from Joseph that we can learn is that he was humble. Verse 20, the Bible says, as he considered this. Four words. As he considered this. Obviously, he was a man of deep thought. He wasn't going to make a, a quick decision. He wasn't going to decide right away what he should be doing. He was contemplating what was happening around him. To me, that speaks of humility because sometimes we lose sight of the fact that one of the most basic things that we can do in this life is acknowledge that sometimes we're just plain wrong. We only see in part. The Bible tells us that our hearts, even our hearts, can deceive us. Think about that. Even our hearts can deceive us. There's a spiritual principle here that if we're going to go on with the Lord, if we're going to go on in our relationships and we're going to grow in godliness, we need to have this posture of humility that acknowledges, look, I could be wrong. And yet, our society doesn't want that, right? Our culture, our culture doesn't put people in front of us who acknowledge they were wrong, right? And yet, there was something that happened in this moment because look at what the Bible says. As he considered this, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream. Joseph, son of David, the angel said, do not be afraid to take Mary as your wife, for the child within her was conceived by the Holy Spirit. She will have a son. And you are to name him Jesus. For he will save his people. From their sins. Thank God. Joseph. Had the wherewithal. To change his plan. This is huge. This is a monumental moment in scripture. Everything we believe hinges on this moment. Think about that. He could have totally blown it. <laughs> Right. I put myself in the text and I'm like, I would have blown it 100 <laughs> percent. Right. I would have taken Mary's. I had a girlfriend that that I really was into in high school and found out she had been cheating on me and wasn't really serious about me. I took every living thing I could find out that I had ever gotten from that girl. Present letter, card, you name it. And I burned it to the ground outside while listening to like heavy metal music. And I video recorded it on top of it. I have no idea if that video still exists anywhere. I wish it did. That would have been me. I don't want nothing to do with this girl, right? I don't want nothing. So, I mean, this is a monumental moment in Scripture. Joseph was in a place, in a position to hear from God. To be able to humbly come before God and say, God, this is what I'm feeling, but I might be wrong. Right? I might be wrong about this. And by the way, isn't it funny um, how we love to tell everyone else what they're wrong about? Right? Isn't it funny how we know everything and we know what everyone else should do? And yet, when you look at Scripture, the direction is to us personally. So Joseph was righteous, Joseph was merciful, Joseph was humble. And finally, and arguably mo most importantly, Joseph was obedient. There's people who have said you can sum up the Christian life in that one co Christian chorus. Trust and obey. Trust and obey. The Bible says, 
verse uh, 24, when Joseph woke up, he did as the angel of the Lord commanded and took Mary as his wife and did not have sexual relationship with her until her son was born. And Joseph named him Jesus. Look, I don't have a lot of time this morning, but there's deep, a deep dive study that you can do on the life of Joseph and look back at his ancestry and this line that he was a part of that fulfilled every single prophecy. Think about that. And in this one moment, he had a decision to make. All of history was riding on this. This whole lineage that he came from, that positioned him in that one place, and yet he still had to do the right thing. There's no way he would have been able to do it if he wasn't righteous, merciful, humble, and obedient. Joseph did what God directed him to do, and that is profound. Here's what I'll tell you. (laughs) It's certainly not easy. Right? It's not. It's not easy to be that person who has that ability, those characters, those qualities, to put all of those pieces into place, to acknowledge that your plan is not God's plan, and to pivot. God's plan for you that may not look like what you think your plan is supposed to look like. God might have something completely different in mind for you than you ever imagined. Will you be the person who can pivot and say, Lord, not my will, but your will be done. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And so it's important for us, I believe, That rather than wait for that moment to come or tell everybody else what they should be doing, (laughs) right? To examine our hearts and our lives and say, Lord, am I that type of person? Am I that type of person that truly believes deep down that God's plan isn't like my plan, but it's the best plan? As you think on these things, as you meditate on these things, as you look at the world around you and see that all that's happening you will see, you'll begin to understand, you'll begin to see the, the mess that we are in, in our world today, in our culture, in our country, is simply because we do not have men and women of God like Joseph, who are righteous, merciful, humble, and obedient before the Lord. And until that gets resolved, nothing else will. And here's what I believe That is so important. In order for us to move forward with God as a church, we have to follow his voice. It's a very peculiar thing that I've learned um, over the time that I've been here. And that is that my role is a weird role. And you've heard me say this many times, but it's an interim role. Every pastor is an interim pastor. And what we're collectively trying to do as a church is not follow me, not follow my leadership or my ideas, but collectively follow the voice of God in our in our midst and hear what the Lord is saying to us as a church, to hear what the Lord is saying to us in a group of people. Because as we do that, we should be coming more and more in tune, more and more in line with God's plans and purpose for us as a church. When people ask me, what's the point of your church? What's the mission of your church? What's the vision of your church? What are you trying to accomplish? We're seeking to know Christ and make him known. To follow his voice. And be, not only do what he's called us to do, but to be who he's called us to be. The being is a lot harder than the doing sometimes. Anyone can start a cat ministry. No offense, Kim. (laughs) But to withstand something and to go through the fiery trials of the ups and downs of whatever it is, you have to be closely connected 
to God. I think this is why Jesus said, if you abide in me and I in you, you will bear much fruit. You see, the producing of the fruit is not our problem. Isn't that awesome? Our job isn't to produce the fruit. Our job is to cultivate a place for it to grow and prosper and flourish as we hear his voice. That's not always easy, but it's important. And one of the best ways that you and I can make sure that we're being who we're called to be is by being flexible with our plans. You remember that's how I started today. How flexible are you? Now you know what I was talking about. We're not going to have you come up and do any aerobics or yoga. <laughs> how flexible are you? So Lord, we praise you this morning. We thank you. Because Lord, your spirit is here. And you want to lead us and guide us by your spirit. And so Lord, as we consider Joseph, as we consider his part in you coming to the earth and you uh, fulfilling the mission that the Father had for you. Lord, let it inspire us. Let it be something inside of us that says, not my will, but your will be done in our lives. And as Amanda shared, Lord, let it not just be on certain parts of our lives but over every corner of our lives, every facet of our lives. Lord, forgive us for the time where we have dug in and insisted on our way. When you're gently nudging us to merge onto your lane. Let us be a people like Joseph who are close to your heart who hear your voice and can pivot when it's necessary. We worship you. We praise you today. We honor you this morning in Jesus' name. And everyone said, amen, amen. <clears throat> um, one announcement that I wasn't planning on sharing, but I'll just do this really quick. Um, a lot of you know that... Uh, a few years ago, I started helping people with Medicare, and I've developed some relationships with people outside of our church and the community. Um, there's a, a guy from my office, actually, the guy who owns the building that I'm in now. His name's Chris. He's a financial planner. He's been helping out uh, a family, a single mom with four young kids uh, for the last several weeks. And um, our boys went over there, I don't even remember what day it was, a few days ago, helped with unloading uh, the moving truck to help get them organized. And then I was back over there on Friday with Chris to put together a bunk bed. Um, they, I don't know if they need anything or I don't know any of the details, but I do know she needs a lot of help organizing her apartment. So we got everything out and up into the apartment. And then on Friday when I went back in, I thought, oh my word, it just looked like a bomb went off. <laughs> so if you're the type of person who likes to go into those kind of chaotic situations, help bring organization, help with just unboxing a box or two here or there or wherever. Um, I know that Chris's church, he's a part of Calvary. They're uh, playing a part in it as well. Um, just let me know. I can get you connected uh, with her and with them. Uh, she's in the apartment uh, right on First Street at the roundabout there upstairs on the north side across from the post office right here in town. Um, and she's got a lot of work in front of her. Um, again, we were able to put the bunk bed together Friday. Um, but she would probably love some organizational help. If you want to help put things away, put things, get her settled, just let me know. Otherwise, God bless you. Have a great week. See you next Sunday.